thinks of itself as uh, uh, at the very, very center with some p small Pacific islands and s the southern part of Southeast Asia. People from the Pacific uh, tend to think the center of the Asia Pacific region is the Pacific Islands, which loom large uh, on the map. Australians think Papua New Guinea is in the Pacific <laughs> and is part of it, and they also think that they, they, they don't count the same number of islands and uh, have a colonial history. So it's a very different Asia Pacific. But the region has come to be the Pacific Islands, Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. And as a region, it's religiously uh, immensely diverse. It's not only diverse in terms of uh, literally thousands of distinct native religious traditions, it's also religiously diverse, diverse in terms of the world, the large faiths. Um, it has, uh, the, the Asia Pacific has countries with Muslim majorities and Christian minorities. Muslim majorities with Tamil Hindu and Buddhist and Christian minorities. You're meant to be guessing which countries these are. There are Buddhist majorities with Muslim minorities. There are two of those. There are Buddhist majorities with Christian minorities, one of those. There's a Catholic majority with a Muslim minority. And there are two countries with Christian and post-Christian majorities with much smaller numbers of Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus. It seems as if the Asia Pacific has almost every permutation, and uh, each of the permutations uh, creates quite a different uh, dynamic for interfaith and for the relationships between religions. The region is uh, currently involved in three ongoing religiously defined uh, armed conflicts. And uh, there are post-massacre and historic tensions across the region. The interfaith movements uh, across the Asia Pacific um, had their beginnings in ecumenical intra-religious developments. And rather strangely, um, the, uh, in Thailand, um, the Congress of Buddhists predates their interfaith activity, just as the uh, Council of Churches in Samoa predates its interfaith activity, and ecumenical activity in Australia among Christians um, created a foundation on which interfaith uh, activities uh, developed. Phase one was largely communal and local initiatives. And uh, these are different, as I say, in different countries. Uh, two years ago when I was in KL, I went to the Interfaith Council for their annual general meeting, and everyone goes to the Interfaith Council in Kuala Lumpur except the Muslims, uh, because interfaith there means everyone but the Muslims. <laughs> and uh, when I asked why the Muslims weren't there, uh, Islam is a way of life, it's a national treasure, uh, but it's not a religion, so they don't belong there. So everyone spent two days moaning about the Muslims. <laughs> so the interfaith looks very different. Phase two in the Asia Pacific came in the wake of 9-11, and uh, there was suddenly a new player uh, brought into interfaith activities, which were the governments of the region. And so interfaith meetings were increasingly partnered and fostered by governments with a very, very particular agenda. The agenda was counter-terrorism. The agenda was interfaith activity to promote religious moderation. Interfaith activity um, driven by a very particular uh, political uh, uh, mindset. This began regionally uh, in Yogyakarta in Indonesia at the initiative of uh, a man called Alexander Downer and Yudono, the president of uh, Indonesia, the first regional interfaith dialogue. Um, it's strange, it's now in its uh, next year, hopefully there will be RID 7, Regional Interfaith Dialogue 7, and the en route they've been uh, in Non Pen, in Cebu in the Philippines, in Waitangi in New Zealand, in Perth in Australia, and in Semarang in Indonesia. Um, but they've morphed into something else in that they're still sponsored by government. The government still seem to have counter 
terrorist agendas, um, but the participants seem to have their own agendas and uh, have kind of, it's been taken over by the religious leaders who form the delegations. Um, so much so that when there was the crisis a couple of years ago, the first Rohingya massacre in Myanmar, um, I was able to ring up the Myanmar people on the delegation for a non-governmental uh, advisory. So they've, uh, they've led to friendships, both interreligious and intra-religious friendships. And generally, I think they're more valuable than the governments realize, um, but another level. Phase three has been very specific developments from the beginning of the first decade of the 21st century, um, a kind of intensification of country developments. New Zealand, my country for Anglican sake, now has seven functioning regional interfaith councils, an Abrahamic uh, council in Wellington, a council of Christians and Muslims in Auckland. And uh, what's developed out of this is a kind of political profile. Um, these aren't representative groups, but they think they are and uh, they increasingly deal with government uh, over a variety of religious issues and with each other. The latest phase of this has been the last three or four years where there have been bilateral as well as multilateral interfaith arrangements. So there was a Buddhist Christian a meeting in Auckland. Uh, I attended a Jewish Hindu meeting in Wellington. And What's been very interesting is that uh, these bilateral meetings have very, very specific agendas that are much more specific than any interfaith agenda. And so um, the, they, the, 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 uh, the stereotypes, the, uh, the work to be overcome are all very different. Uh, um, none of the Hindus I met from India or from Fiji had ever heard of Jews and were surprised that the Jews wanted to meet them, um, but uh, shared a great deal uh, in terms of uh, particular pressures on their faith and their religion and uh, had very particular discussions. And Buddhists and Christians likewise discussed that they, uh, they uh, things of mutual interest that they didn't fully recognize. The last in th phase three has been concerted effort over social issues and other issues. And so there is an interfaith committee um, looking at climate change. There is a, uh, in an interfaith committee looking at refugee support given the European refugee crisis. And uh, I took place in a, uh, uh, a housing, uh, the uh, Auckland housing crisis seminar, which was arranged uh, by the Muslim community in conjunction with the Anglicans. And so there's a great deal of work. Those are the three phases as I see them. We might get different stories from our participants. There is a huge impact and huge uh, level of charity work and uh, philanthropic work, um, particularly in the provision of statutory welfare by um, churches and church charities uh, across the region. Um, there is uh, a very particular model in New Zealand, which is a, a kind of competitive model, which uh, uh, very often welfare is at the sharp end of uh, neoliberal policies. The development in the Pacific cannot be thought of without, religious, uh, without a religious dimension. Uh, in the Pacific, the vast ma in the Pacific Islands, the vast majority of the population is Christian, um, but Christians can have enough, uh, even more debates and disputes uh, within the Christian community than other faiths can across. Um, the first climate change refugee I mentioned this morning from New Zealand uh, led to an interfaith uh, campaign, uh, although uh, the. Uh, the person involved from Kiribati was rejected. Um, but the C Interfaith Climate Committee is making provision and planning both research papers for government and uh, concerted action in relation to uh, the inevitability of climate change refugees to New Zealand. Now, the, um, the agenda, I think, for interfaith uh, in our area is we need uh, coordinated and concerted uh, action between different faith groups and particularly interfaith groups. Um, we need to work on 
uh, realistic and, sen and working partnerships with government. And uh, lastly, I suspect um, that uh, we need to have more modest aims than we sometimes have. My job now is to introduce an illustrious panel. It's 25% reduced because one person didn't come, which makes our speakers who are here even more illustrious. Let me introduce you to them uh, from my left, and then uh, they will uh, have papers and there'll be the time for discussion. The first is, uh, on, my, on my far left, is Dr. Keith Thompson. Uh, uh, Keith is an associate professor and the associate dean of the School of Law at the University of Notre Dame in Sydney. Uh, he is the uh, uh, coordinator, the teacher of an innovative religion and law course, and uh, he's had a very long career both as an academic uh, and as a, a practicing uh, lawyer. He has particular expertise in property law and commercial, both uh, in terms of experience and teaches constitutional law. Uh, last night I read a paper about religious speech in the public squ uh, square that he sent me, and uh, he's the author of Religious Confession Privilege and the Common Law. And uh, he's the first of our lawyers. Sitting next to him is our second, there were three, but we've lost one, uh, the, the, our second lawyer, uh, Dr. Asmi Wood. And uh, uh, Asmi Wood is uh, also uh, someone who teaches constitutional law, and uh, he is a senior lecturer in law at the College of Law at the Australian National University. Um, he's a, a lawyer with a degree in engineering and a degree in law uh, and a, a PhD in law, uh, which focused on the regulation of the use of force by non-state actors under international law. And he has a broad range of interests in Aboriginal law, uh, in, uh, uh, in international law, and as I said, he teaches constitutional law, and he also, um, I spent breakfast talking to him about law and terrorism, so his, his range is, uh, uh, is prodigious and, uh, and very uh, impressive. Um, he's been very active, uh, he was active at the National Center for Indigenous Studies, and uh, he is a recipient at his university of the Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. So we have great hopes for your, uh, your presentation. Um, he is a particular advocate for uh, understanding of uh, Indigenous Australian Muslims, and uh, will uh, no, no doubt uh, uh, bring that perspective. Our final speaker is uh, a great disappointment. He's not a lawyer. <laughs> but this is uh, Dr. Polo Lumavai, and I'm very, very pleased to uh, introduce him. Uh, he is uh, a, a senior lecturer and uh, in the Theology and Ethics Department of the Pacific Theological College. Um, he's a Methodist by background. He gave me his bio, which I'll read. He is uh, a leading scholar on Pacific relational hermeneutics, relational theology, and relational ethics. Um, he uh, formerly taught and was a university, was a college seminary chaplain at Pula College, and uh, his MA and PhD are from Griffith uh, University. Without further ado, we the the speakers will follow the order: uh, Keith, Asmi, and then Upolo. And uh, you have um, 14 and a half minutes each. <laughs> 